So it's a, a great pleasure to have Chris Akers here today to tell us about leading order corrections to the quantum extremal surface prescription. So go ahead, Chris, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very excited to be here talking to y'all. Um, so the alternate title that I, I give to quantum information crowds whenever I give this talk is how one shot quantum information theory saves holography. And um, that title actually might be better because it emphasizes what I think is really the deep point, uh, which is that one shot quantum information theory um, shows up and sort of changes how you might want to think about holography. Um, but the leading order corrections, I think, is something that has more significance right away to holographers. And so that's why um, I'm going with that title. So this is work I did with Jeff Pennington. Um, <laughs> we published it back in August. So here it goes. So the background is uh, we start with the Reed Takinagi prescription. So as I'm sure most of you are familiar with, um, this is a prescription in the context of ADS CFT. So here I've drawn the typical diagram where ADS is some gravitational theory uh, in space time, sort of in the, the center of this can. It's the, the soup in the can of soup. And then the CFT lives on the boundary on this cylinder. Um, so if I consider a time slice, so that's given by this cross section diagram here, I could divide the boundary into um, subregions. So let's consider this subregion B drawn here, capital B. This is a subregion of the CFT. And um, you might be interested in computing its von Neumann entropy, which is typically a very hard, a, a sophisticated, difficult thing to compute in a quantum field theory, especially. Um, but the Reed Takinagi prescription gives you this nice way of using the bulk to compute it rather easily. Um, and it's kind of a beautiful formula because it relates it to some geometric quantity in the bulk. Um, so of course, what you're supposed to do in the RT prescription, if you want to compute the von Neumann entropy of this region B, is find the surface gamma in the bulk that has minimal area. And then the von Neumann entropy of B equals the area of this gamma divided by four times Newton's constant. And this is supposed to be correct at leading order in some uh, one over G Newton expansion. So you're taking G Newton to be very small. So one over G Newton is very big. And then this is sort of the leading piece of that expansion. In 2013, uh, this was Faulkner, Lubitz, and Malvasena found um, how you're supposed to add the next order correction. So this is something that's order one in this G Newton expansion. And so this is, you could call the RT plus FLM prescription. Uh, but the gamma, the gamma is still the same, but now you just add the entropy of this region uh, between gamma and B. So this is the homology region of gamma. Its von Neumann entropy is the order one piece. Shortly thereafter, in 2014, Engelhardt and Wall conjectured the quantum extremal surface prescription, which is now the state of the art. So what it says is it's, you know, it's very similar qualitatively. Um, so you're still computing the von Neumann entropy of B by finding some surface um, that minimizes something in the bulk. But what you're doing is minimizing a different quantity. So the surface is now some, what I'm calling gamma QES that minimizes not the area, but it minimizes the area over 4G Newton plus the entropy of the homology region. So if you call A over 4G plus S, something like this, you call that the generalized entropy of B, of little b. Sorry if there's some background noise. There's a gardener here. Um, I hope it's not too bad. Uh, if you call this sort of quantity, A over 4G plus S, the generalized entropy, then um, you're supposed to find the surface gamma that minimizes the generalized entropy. And then the von Neumann entropy of this region capital B equals the generalized entropy of that bulk region. So I want to emphasize that the QAS prescription is extremely important in modern holography. It is, it is uh, the cornerstone of a, a lot of our key results. And uh, I'll just list two very important famous results. So the first is entanglement wedge reconstruction. So this is the, the statement that the information in little b, this is again, this a commodity reading here. Don't want to erase that. In little b um, is in, is encoded in capital B. So this is something that if you want to understand, you can prove it with the quantum extremal surface prescription. 
this was done in this paper by Don Carlo and Wall, and then it was um, sort of promoted with a, with a slightly more careful treatment of the error um, in this paper by Hayden and Pennington. And it, it's very important to our understanding of holography. It tells us which subregions of the bulk uh, can be understood as dual to which subregions of the boundary CFT. Also very important, coming from the QS prescription, are these black hole information updates from 2019. So last year there was these, these, these uh, set of results that basically gave you a, a way in gravity to compute the page curve, right? And this is the fact that the Hawking radiation carries away information about what forms the black hole. Um, so now we all, like, we all believed that, or maybe most of us believed that uh, when black holes form and evaporate, the, the Hawking radiation carries away the information, uh, even before these results. But those arguments mostly came from looking at the dual CFT. So there was no native gravity calculation that told you this happened. Um, but now if you treat the radiation sort of like a boundary uh, theory, and you, you apply the QES prescription to it, then you actually um, compute an entropy that is consistent with the radiation carrying away the information. Um, that, that was the result of these, these two papers uh, back in May of last year. So I wanna emphasize something very important about this result in particular. So not only is it, does it rely on the QES prescription, right, and not, like it wouldn't have worked with RT or RT plus FLM because the, the, the fact that you were minimizing something that included a bulk entropy was extremely important. Uh, the QES surface was uh, very far away from any surface that minimized just the area. And this was because, in part, that uh, there was a lot of von, Neu of von Neumann entropy hanging around. So there was a lot of Hawking radiation with a lot of entropy. So the fact that bulk entropy was very large mattered. So that's all background. My goal in this talk is to tell you that it's exactly in these scenarios when there is a lot of entropy, a lot of bulk entropy, that you have to be extremely careful when applying the QES prescription. Um, so in fact, there are contradictions that you can get at leading order in this prescription. This is order one over G Newton, if you just apply the QS prescription naively. So indeed, like in any setting you wanna consider, but in particular, these settings from, from these two papers of last year, you will, uh, draw, you will compute entropies that are inconsistent, that don't make sense if you just apply the QS prescription naively. Um, I won't really emphasize this later, so I'll just say it now. Uh, the reason we never noticed these contradictions before is because we always cared about relatively simple states, states that are like the thermal state or a pure state. These states are actually very simple in the sense that their entanglement spectrum, the spectrum of their density matrix, uh, all the eigenvalues were relatively um, similar to each other. All the eigenvalues that mattered were basically the same. Once you lift that assumption, if you consider states where the eigenvalues are not all the same, then um, you can easily find contradictions with the QES prescription. That's what I'll show you. So I'm gonna explain in more detail later why these contradictions occur. And then, time permitting, I will fix things, um, deriving sort of refined conditions for when the QES prescription is valid. So you won't have to leave this worrying that the QES prescription like has these contradictions, maybe we can't trust it at all. No, I'm going to tell you exactly when you can trust it and uh, when you can't. Okay, so let me start by showing you a sharp problem with the QES prescription. And, and of course, I don't know what your conventions are, but please interrupt me with questions if you have them. Um, so here's a sharp problem. I'm trying this color coding of blue and red, so I hope it's not uh, more confusing. I hope it clears things up. So, so here I'm considering a particular setup in ADS CFT. And the setup is not supposed to be fine tuned. It's supposed to be very um, mundane. So I've divided the, the boundary into four regions. Um, and then I've said B is the union of this top and bottom region. So capital B is this top part union, this bottom part. And then it's complement B bar 
is the union of the left part and the right part. Okay, so there are, so if you were trying to compute the von Neumann entropy of capital B, you would want to know what the possible minimal surfaces are, minimal generalized entropy surfaces. There's two. So either gamma one, which is this red uh, surface, and this is homotopic to B bar. Uh, that's one candidate. And then the other candidate is this blue dash surface, gamma two, um, which is homotopic to B. And um, I'll say more about this later, but throughout, I'm going to be assuming that, that the blue surface is much greater area than the red surface. By much greater, I mean the difference is like order one in G Newton. So, but it's a big order one number. Like it, it doesn't have to grow with G Newton, but it has to be big. Between these two surfaces is a region um, that I'm calling B prime. So, so little b is the region that's the homology region of gamma two. Little b bar is the homology region of gamma one. B prime is the rest of the bulk. It's the part in the middle. And in little b prime, I'm putting some quantum matter. Uh, it could be anything. It's not really important. Uh, it could just be a dust ball. That's how I prefer to think of it. So this is just a bunch of spins. Um, you know, they might interact, but you can take the limit that the dust ball is very dilute. So these like spin spin interactions are very weak and they don't change the energy much depending on the state of the spins. So it's just some quantum matter. Could even be a black hole, but it doesn't have to be. And I'm gonna consider different states of this matter in the middle here. Um, these states rho will be density matrices. Um, and what's important is that their density matrices on a Hilbert space of dimension exponential in one over G. So they, they just need to be big. Um, so this needs to be like a dust ball that, ha that has many possible states that grows G Newton. Um, this, you know, you might think that makes it have to be a black hole. In fact, it turns out it does not. It could be uh, still very dilute dust. If the dust has energy that's like epsilon over G Newton, for epsilon some order one, but very, very small number, it can still be dust. It doesn't have to be a black hole. If epsilon's order one, this situation's kind of shady. Maybe it violates some energy conditions unless it's a black hole. So, but I, but I just want something um, that doesn't have to be a black hole, that has a Hilbert space of this dimension. So it's just a lot of dust, maybe. Okay, so I'm going to consider a few states of the dust ball, and then I'm going to compute their entropy. You, I'm going to compute the entropy of B, given that these dust, like the dust ball is in each of these different um, states. And I'm going to see what the answer is for the entropy of B, given the QES prescription. So the first state, this is a state of this, the dust that's a thermal state. And what's important is that if it's some high temperature thermal state, then its entropy could be um, order one over G Newton. Like if the Hilbert space dimension was e to the order one over G Newton, then a high temperature thermal state uh, could have entropy that's um, you know, extensive in the dust ball and therefore also order one over G Newton. That, that's, that's the only thing that I need out of this thermal state is that it's um, more or less, yeah, is that it's, um, its entropy is large in this sense. So this is, a, this is a state of the dust. This is a bulk state has this entropy. And I'm going to demand that this entropy is bigger than the area difference over 4G Newton. That's just part of my definition of the setup. So the area difference was large. Um, and then the entropy of the dust ball is going to be even larger. Why am I demanding that? Because I want to use the QES prescription to compute the entropy of capital B. And I want it to give me that this is the, the entropy. So this is in fact the case given this top line. Why is that? Because um, S of B using the QES prescription is either the generalized entropy of the blue surface, which is just its area, because there's no entropy in little b, or it would be the generalized entropy of the gamma 
one surface, which would you know, be the area of the red surface <clears throat> plus the entropy of the dust ball. But because we said the, the dust ball had a lot of entropy, the, uh, the blue surface is actually more minimal if the dust ball is in this state. And so um, this is the entropy of B given the dust balls in the thermal state. The second state I want to consider is much simpler. So consider a dust ball state where, where uh, uh, it's pure. So like all the spins are just in some particular pure state. Then the, ent the entropy of the dust ball is zero. And this means that if you use the QS prescription to compute the von Neumann entropy of capital B, you just get that it equals the area of the red surface because that's the more minimal surface. So we just have these two states. One has this von Neumann entropy, oops, and then one has this von Neumann entropy. Now, I'm gonna consider one more state, rho mix. This is just a mixture of those two states, and it's gonna be an arbitrary mixture. So I'm gonna pick P to be some number between zero and one. And for simplicity, let's just say it's order one. So it could be like a half or something. It doesn't really matter, but um, so it's just gonna be some order one mixture of these two states. And let's compute the, the von Neumann entropy of B using the QES prescription, um, now assuming that the dust ball is in this state. What you would get is this. So let me unpack this. So again, you just wanna see what's more minimal, the blue surface or the red surface. Um, if the, the blue surface is more minimal, of course, this is just the uh, von Neumann entropy of B because uh, there was no, again, it's the same answer. There was no uh, matter in little b. Um, this quantity right here, one minus P times S of rho therm, that is the von Neumann entropy of the dust ball in this state. Why is that? Because um, basically the von Neumann entropy of some mixture of states equals the von Neumann, like the average of the von Neumann entropy is plus uh, some correction, which is zero if these are orthogonal. We can take them to be orthogonal or approximately orthogonal. Um, so, so the point is rho pure has no entropy. So the, the von Neumann entropy of rho mix is just going to be um, the probability of being in the thermal states times the entropy of the thermal states. So that's the von Neumann entropy of rho mix. And so uh, if the red surface is more minimal, then the von Neumann entropy of capital B is just its area plus the von Neumann entropy of the dust ball. These conditions on the right-hand side are just the statement of which one's more minimal. That's the QES. That's what the QES says the von Neumann entropy of capital B is, if the dust ball's in this state. However. Uh, Chris, just a quick question. Yes. So if the dust ball is in this state, do you, uh, do we expect to have like a semi-classical description of the bug? Uh, I would say yes, because it's, n yeah, we, we do. In fact, um, because we can take, we can consider a situation where all the different states of the dust ball have the same geometry or approximately the same geometry up to some high order in GU. Um, because we can say the spins, like the different states of the dust ball are like different spin states and the different, uh, different spin states okay. can have very similar energy. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah, so it's a, it, good. That's a great question. Yeah, it's a very semi classical state that is like a mundane. It's not some superposition of geometries, it's just a different quantum state. So now, this formula, I claim, cannot be correct. We computed it with the QS prescription, but it can't be right. The reason is this if, if you consider any density matrix, that is some mixture of other density matrices. So these rho i are a bunch of density matrices. These pi are just some probabilities on them. Um, and we're summing up k of them. I'm not even assuming that the rho i are all orthogonal or anything. They could be the same, they could all be orthogonal, like anything in between, that's fine. This rho obeys the following two bounds. So the von Neumann entropy of rho has to be greater than the average of the von Neumann entropies of the rho i. That's this lower bound here. And uh, that's just because uh, you can work this out with equations and like a, a 
few lines, but morally it's because the uncertainty in rho must be larger than the average uncertainty in the mixture, or at least as large. Similar for this upper bound. The upper bound is actually the more important one for us. So you can work this out in a few lines. Um, and the way you do that is you say, you, you notice that the entropy of rho has to be smaller than that of uh, a state that's related to it. So if you took a reference system R and you gave this, re you had, this reference system R has a set of orthonormal states I, um, you know, has at least K orthonormal states and you correlated it with the row I in this way. So you're basically making all of the, for all I now, whoops, for all I now, um, the states are distinguishable. You compute the von Neumann entropy of this state. It is this right-hand side. And it's a fact that you can argue that um, the von Neumann entropy of this state must be larger than the von Neumann entropy of this state. Um, so that's this upper bound, that this quantity here, upper bounds this one. Oh, okay. What's important about these bounds is that it means the von Neumann entropy of rho has to be within order log k of the average of the von Neumann entropies of the rho i. Um, that's so like the, the average just shows up on both sides, in both bounds. The only difference between the bounds is this quantity here. This is called the, the Shannon term. And um, you, can, you can prove, if you want, I can argue it to you, that uh, it's at most order log k in magnitude. Remember k was the how many states we're taking in the mixture. And um, good. And in our example before, rho mix here, was just the mixture of two states. So k is two, whoops, I'm going way, way too far down. k is two, and so therefore s of b, given the dust ball was in this row mix state, has to be within an order one number, like order log two of this average here. That is very different from the QES answer we got. So, so I'll plot this difference. So um, I hope these colors are not too confusing. Let me explain it. So on the x-axis, I've plotted one minus P. On the y-axis, I've plotted S of B. And when one minus P is zero, both, both this answer here, the correct answer, and the QES answer that we got are A1. And again, when one minus P is one, uh, again, they agree. However, in the middle, the average answer, this, this one I'm calling the correct answer, uh, just is a line between them, a straight line. Whereas the QES answer looked more like this. It was this upper curve, this red and then blue curve that I've labeled naive. So I, I put it in two colors because this, uh, this slope is whenever the red surface was more minimal and then the, the plateau the, was when the blue surface was more minimal. Whereas, uh, so the correct answer is actually just always an average of those two. It's a purple surface, if you will. And so uh, these answers are, are just in general different at leading order, order one over G Newton. I'm sorry, did you, yeah. did, you, did you say where the correct answer came from? Was it just using the bound and, and some up? Yes, like, yes, I yes. I just used the bounds. So, so when I say correct, I mean, uh, we have to assume I see. With, that the with an order, okay. Yeah, exactly. I'm just, yeah, so whatever the correct answer is, it has to be, if I'm plotting the leading order thing, this, it has to be this. Um, and it's different than this naive answer that the QS prescription gave us. Sorry, and thanks. Yeah, good. So, um, so this was the sharp problem. Um, so now let's ask the question, why did this naive, a naive application of the QS prescription fail here? What's different about row mix that made it fail for it and not for row pure and row therm? Because I claim, it, and this will be true, this is true, that the QES prescription actually gave you the right answer for row pure and row therm. Uh, and, right, and it just, what went wrong was it gave you the wrong answer for row mix. So he, here's the, the answer. So intuitively, the answer 
is that the naive QES just can't handle a mixture of states on different sides of a surface transition. So we just took one state that was on one side, like the red surface was dominant, and then we took it, we mixed it with a state that was on the other side, but the blue surface was dominant. And I claimed the QS description just doesn't know how to handle that. It doesn't handle it appropriately. Um, that's not very precise because many states, including the thermal states, can be regarded as a mixture of states on different sides of the transition, and uh, the QS description works for the thermal state. So what, like, what's a more precise way to say what went wrong? So the precise problem was that row mix is not what I'm going to call perfectly compressible. So this is not maybe what quantum information theorists call perfectly compressible, but it, the definition uh, that I'm, I'm using this definition. So a state row is called perfectly compressible if there exists another state, sigma, that's close to row. Here I've written it close to row in uh, trace distance. So, but you can use whatever distance measure. Um, some work better for certain reasons, but it's just close to row. And sigma needs to have a rank um, that is uh, no more than exponential in the von Neumann entropy of rho up to something that's subleading, like in one in, in G Newton. So in the lar in the small G Newton expansion, um, something is perfectly compressible if it's close to a state uh, whose rank is just e to its von Neumann entropy. I claim row mix does not have this property, but the other two do. So let me prove that. So the thermal state in the thermodynamic limit has a von Neumann entropy that in fact equals its, like it's the log of its rank, in fact, equals its von Neumann entropy. So, you know, it is its own sigma here. And so it's therefore perfectly compressible. And, and also the pure state um, sort of trivially is perfectly compressible because its rank is one, so the log of its rank is zero, and that's also its von Neumann entropy. So this equality works. Pure state's also perfectly compressible. However, for this row mixed state, something different happens. In fact, its von Neumann entropy equals one minus p times the log of the rank of sigma for any sigma that's close to row mix. I, this is something that you can prove and um, we can talk about it, but it just turns out to be true. Um, in fact, I'll motivate it more in, in a second. So this means it's not perfectly compressible. So there's this difference between these, these states. Okay, so maybe you accept that there's this difference, but why should compressibility matter? We've never talked about compressibility in ADS CFT um, in, in this context before. So here, here's the high level answer, and I'm gonna unpack it uh, as we go on. So here I've, I've sort of redrawn the time slice so that you can, uh, I can make reference to it. So again, we just had B and then B prime is this middle region between the blue, blue dotted lines. Um, so the answer is that the ADS to CFT, the ADS CFT dictionary um, is an isomorphism between Hilbert spaces, right? Or it, that's part of it. So for any bulk state, there's, you know, there's this map that is the dictionary that maps you to a boundary state. And a map between, yeah. And in fact, in subregion duality is sort of a stronger statement that if you have a state, a density matrix in some subregion of the bulk, you can map that to a density matrix in a certain subregion of the boundary. So the ADS CFT dictionary has these maps from states in the bulk to states in the boundary, subregions to subregions. And maps from states to states are quantum channels. You don't need to be familiar with quantum channels. Um, that's almost the, the definition of them. Uh, and the point is that which I'll, I'll motivate later on, is that the channel that maps the state of B prime to capital B has a limited capacity. It, it can't carry arbitrarily much information. And so through this map, this channel, B prime transmits to capital B 
this particular limited number of qubits. So it's a, it's a number that's proportional to the difference in areas of the blue and the red surface. This is something that was um, computed in Hayden and Pennington in 2018. This is their alphabets from Black Hole's paper. Um, but time permitting, I could, I could explain it. But basically, B, B prime can't, there, more information than this number of qubits in B prime uh, won't make it to capital B through the ADS to CFT map. And so, if uh, a state in B prime can't fit into that number of qubits, then its state and therefore its entropy can't be transmitted to B via this ADS to CFT map. Okay, so that's why compressibility matters. So if you have a state that can't be compressed to the appropriate number of qubits, then uh, capital B won't know about its state or entropy and therefore um, it, it can't affect the entropy of capital B. So this will become clearer as we go on. So that's why compressibility matters, the high level argument. So, um, what, so how do people usually talk about compressibility? How do quantum information theorists think about compressibility? So usually um, it's quantified by the smooth max entropy. This is a quantity you may or may not have heard of. Um, it's written this way. So it's H max with this epsilon. This epsilon um, will be explained shortly. And then this is H max of a particular state row. So by definition, this is the definition of this smooth max entropy. There exists a sigma that's close to rho such that the log of the rank of sigma is approximately equal to the max entropy, the smooth max entropy. So, so again, this is very similar to the formula we had for perfectly compressible, except now instead of the von Neumann entropy here, it's the max entropy. So for rho mix, uh, its smooth max entropy equals its von Neumann entropy over one minus p. So it, you know, its smooth max entropy is bigger than its von Neumann entropy. In fact, it's always greater than or equal to, for any state, it's greater than or equal to its von Neumann entropy. So here it just happens to equal this particular quantity. So I, um, this, this might answer a question that you have in the back of your mind. So, so just to clarify, the, uh, the smooth max entropy of rho mix is actually the same roughly as the smooth max entropy of the thermal state. But the thermal state had much greater von Neumann entropy. So um, this, the thermal state fit our definition of perfectly compressible, even though they're technically compressible to only to the same number of qubits. I'll say more about this um, in a second. Actually, will I? I don't think I will for a bit. So let me know if you have questions about that. So if you were to sit down and think about this and to take this into account, say, OK, how does this high level compressibility argument um, how should it affect our prescription for computing von Neumann entropy of B? How should it change the QES prescription? You would do the following to take it into account. And I'm, so I'm just going to, this is how I'm motivating what will be the answer. Um, but then I will prove it using a more rigorous argument. So again, I've just redrawn. Um, this time slice. And let me remind you that the, re the regular QES way of computing the von Neumann entropy of capital B is just th this piecewise function. So, you know, it just equals um, A1 over, it just equals the area of the red surface over 14 Newton plus um, the von Neumann entropy of B prime or the area of the blue surface, whichever is more minimal. So the whichever is more minimal part is the, are these conditions. And I've just I've just moved all areas to the right side to, to write it this way. So I claim that um, 
using what we talked about with compressibility, um, you would say, okay, these conditions should be modified. Um, you know, whether or not the entropy of B prime makes it, you know, is, is something that B knows about should depend on whether or not the state of B prime uh, can be compressed and sent to capital B through the ADS to CFT map. So it should depend. So it should depend not on whether or not the von Neumann entropy of B prime um, is smaller than the area difference. It should depend on whether or not the max entropy is smaller than the area difference. So that would look like this, and this is that, in fact the right answer. So, um, so so the top line is very similar. So the so the, you get the same answer as in the top case uh, if. Um, H max, the smooth max entropy is less than the area difference. And uh, the condition under which you get this bottom answer, where the, it's just the area of the blue surface, depends on whether this quantity called H min, so this is the smooth min entropy, if that's greater than the area difference. I haven't motivated it, I will, um, but this quantity you can understand, it's just the minus the log of the largest eigenvalue of row B prime. And it's a, it's a quantity that's complementary to the max entropy. So you might understand why it has to show up here um, on the basis of it being complementary to the max entropy. So it's, you know, this, this condition has to do with whether or not the information from B prime makes it to the complement. So this is whether or not it makes it to B, this is whether or not it makes it to the complement of B. Um, now, what's, what's really important about this new formula is that because it replaces the von Neumann entropy with the max and the min entropy, uh, those are two different quantities. The max and the min entropy are not, in general, equal. So the, the max entropy is, in general, um, I'll write this here, so H max is in general greater than the von Neumann entropy, which is in general greater than or yeah, both in general greater than or equal to the min entropy. So um, there are situations that you could consider in which the max entropy is on one side of the area difference and the min entropy is on the other side. And it's exactly in these situations where you get an answer that is not given by the, a naive application of the QAS prescription. So this new formula is something you would come up, come up with if you thought about compressibility and why it matters. And it resolves the contradiction that we saw in the very beginning because the row mix was landed exactly in this middle regime. Um, I did not go through those details but you saw, yes, but it's true. If you compute its max entropy and its min entropy, they straddle the area difference. And so um, that's exactly, so you should expect that the QES description would not apply to that state because it lands in this middle regime if you're using this new formula. So this is, uh, good, so it handles situations like the one we just saw, but it's not actually the most general formula I want to show you because it doesn't handle entanglement very well. So what, what, if, the, what if there's more than just matter in B prime? What if there's matter also say in little b or matter here and they're all entangled with each other? You know, that's not just mixed states. What happens then? So what about with entanglement? So it could look like this, say, um, what you do in that case is the following. It's a it's simple generalization. So recall that the a naive application of the QS prescription would look like this. It would say, okay, it's either this quantity or this quantity, depending on which one's more minimal. You could write the conditions, which one's more minimal in this way, where I've moved all areas to the right-hand sides of the inequalities and all von Neumann entropies to the left-hand sides of these inequalities. And um, you can just, so a difference in von Neumann entropies can be written in this way. So it's a, 
this is a, a conditional bundling of entropy. You say like this bottom one, for example, would be said to be the von Neumann entropy of B prime given little b. Um, but it's just a difference in von Neumann entropies. I write it this way because the new formula looks like a generalization of that. So you know, with entanglement in these general scenarios, the formula is this. So again, you get the same sort of answers, um, except now you have this middle regime where you can't use the QES prescription. And uh, the conditions have been promoted to conditional smooth max entropies and conditional smooth min entropies. Um, so yeah, th so this is how it, you know, for example, um, like having lots of entanglement between little b and little b prime can, can help um, determine which minimal, uh, which surface is the minimal quantum extremal surface that you should use to compute the entropy. So this is the formula to use if you have two competing surfaces. Um, I haven't proved, I will prove it shortly, but uh, I've just motivated it so far by telling you about compression. I have not told you um, how these condi smooth conditional max and min entropies are related to compression, why you should expect them to show up. So uh, I hope to make that clear. Let me explain to you what they are intuitively. So they have kind of unenlightening definitions. Um, so I will refrain from showing you what they are unless you ask. Um, but then you'll regret asking because they're not super enlightening. But here are the intuitive operational definitions of these things. So the smooth max entropy, uh, the conditional one, uh, you know, uh, is intuitively, it's the number of qubits that Alice would need to state merge with Bob if they had, if they shared a state row AB. So this is, so say there's some state row AB, Alice has the A part, Bob has the B part, and their goal is for Alice to send Bob some qubits and Bob to end up with the state row AB in his lab. Um, there's a little more to it that we also are gonna allow them to use um, unlimited um, like phone call messaging, the like classical data transfer. Um, but given this, this game, the number of qubits that Alice would need to send to Bob is this number, uh, this number here. And that's intuitively related to compression because Alice, that's, how, you know, Alice has to try and compress her part of the state down to as few qubits as possible so that she can send it to Bob and Bob uh, not end up with a state that's very different from what they started with. The conditional min entropy is, has a different sort of interpretation. So if you have a state rho AR, so this is say shared between Alice and Robert. So Alice has the A part and Robert has the R part and Alice wants to quantify how little correlation there is between them. She would be interested in this quantity. So operationally it's the number of maximally mixed qubits that Alice could distill from her part of the state that are uncorrelated with R. So, so she wants to just act on her factor, the A factor, and then um, separate out a set of qubits that are maximally mixed and not at all correlated with anything Robert has. That number would be given by this. That's intuitively what they are. If you sat down and really think about it, you can, you can sort of get the feeling that these should they like it makes sense these are related to um, uh, like the quantum extremal surface prescription. Uh, maybe that's a harder exercise than I'm giving you credit for. Okay, that's what those things are. I'll come back to talking about these quantities. Um, but first, I want to turn to um, how you would actually derive the refined conditions. So, so I'm saying this is sort of the answer. We motivated it, now let's drive it.
as an exercise or a review, let's remember how we derive the original conditions, right? The original quantum, uh, the quantum extremal surface prescription. Um, where, did, where did that come from? So that was, you know, work done at many papers, has commented on this um, by all of these great authors. And um, the way it was done is you, you're trying to compute the von Neumann attribute of capital B, and you do it using one of the best methods that we have, which is where you use the replica trick. So that's, that's to say the following. You take um, the density matrix of capital B and you plug it into this formula. This is great because um, it allows us to, like this is something that we might try and compute using like in quantum field theory. Like you can do a path integral on some uh, in sheeted surface. So we, we like this formula because it's very conducive to calculations in quantum field theory. But we want a holographic formula for S of B. So we plug in the ADS CFT dictionary so that we can use bulk quantities. And that looks like the following. So we replace the trace row B to the N part with this. These are, this is a gravitational quantity. This Z sub B N is a bulk partition function, which is, which is fundamentally some sum over geometries. And then we decide that this bulk partition function is too hard to fully compute. It's too hard for any n, any integer n, and it's especially too hard to analytically continue into one, right? That's what this formula required is that we compute this and then we, we sort of take a limit into one. Uh, it's hard to compute it for any n, much less uh, analytically continue it to n equals one. So um, this is, so we do a trick. This trick goes all the way back to Lucas and Malvicena, where we approximate this sum by its dominant term. So um, you know this this g sub n comma s is sometimes called the saddle geometry, like the dominant saddle geometry. Um, so we approximate zbn this way, and then we plug that all the way back in, and then that allows us to compute this. And if you do that, it gives you what, what I'm going to call the naive uh, QES prescription. And um, so that's how we derive, that's how people have derived the, the usual thing. That, and the problem is that um, when you do this somewhere along the way, in fact, it's this part where you um, restrict the sum to just one term, this forces the state onto one side of the surface transition. So this was the, um, the core problem, right? Because we, we took a state that was actually spread out. It had, it had supports on two sides of the surface transition. And when we applied the QS prescription, it acted as though the state was on one side or the other. It was never giving us an average, which would, which would have been the right answer. So we needed to do um, a different sort of calculation if we want to derive a different set of conditions. So that's what we do. So here's how we derive the fine conditions. There's actually a few calculations. I'm going to show you the one that gives you the most complete answer. So the first step is to specialize to fixed area states. So we have these surfaces A1, uh, gamma 1 and gamma 2. That was red and blue surface. And um, in gravity, there's always fluctuations in the geometry and therefore in the areas of these surfaces. But you can consider states in the bulk that, have, uh, that are approximate eigenstates of the operators that measure these areas. So these are fixed area states. And um, they're, they're really nice. They were defined. By, it's kind of tooting my own horn because they were defined in these two papers. One was by me and Pratik. One was by uh, Don Harlow and Miroff in 2018. These, these fixed area states are uh, really useful for computing. Uh, they're, they're convenient because it's somewhat easy to do replica tricks in these fixed area states. So I'm going to specialize to, to fixing the areas of these surfaces, um, doing a calculation, getting uh, an answer that 
looks like the refined answer. And then I'm going to show, I'm gonna, I might not give you this argument, but we have an argument that because it's, it holds in the fixed area states, you get the same refined formula up to small corrections or more general states without fixed areas. This argument is solid. Um, I don't want to give the impression that it's, it's like on shake your ground than it is. Okay, so we fix the areas and then we, um, and then once you do that, we notice the following thing. So if you want to, if you are computing the von Neumann entropy of B using the replica trick, the calculation is identical to doing the same thing, computing the von Neumann entropy of B in this tensor network here. So um, I'll explain this. Let me emphasize that it's not imperative that we're making it, like we have to make this analogy to tensor networks. You could actually make this argument completely in gravity. It would just be more cumbersome to do and more cumbersome to argue to you. So it's actually just a really nice convenience that we can make this argument via tensor networks, not something that's necessary. So what I'm saying is that uh, consider this tensor network. So it's a very simple one. So you have um, three tensors, that's these boxes. Each of them have three legs. So that's like these lines coming out of them. And um, so this leg on the left here is a very large dimension and um, I'm regarding it as a boundary leg. It's part of the boundary of this tensor network and I'm calling it capital B. And then this leg over here on the right, it, I'm calling capital B bar. It's also a boundary leg. So these two legs are analogous to the, the circle on the outside here of, of, the, of the time slice that we've been dealing with this whole time. And um, the, these legs, these vertical legs up here that I've labeled little b, little b prime, and little b bar are analogous to these regions of the bulk. So uh, B prime is this middle leg, little b is analogous to this leg here, and then little b bar is analogous to this leg uh, here. And you sort of make sense because little b is like the bulk region. So these are like what I'm calling the bulk legs, these three legs. Little b is like the bulk region that's closest to capital B. That's true here as well. And um, little b bar is closest to capital B bar and little b prime is in the middle. And separating these regions in both the tensor network and our original setup were, are these surfaces. So here it's these, um, there's a leg. So each tensor had a leg that came out um, and then we projected those two legs onto a maximally entangled state. Um, that's represented by this connected leg I've colored it this one blue just to show you that it matches, it's supposed to be analogous to this blue gamma two down here. And then this one red to show you that it's analogous to this red surface in our original diagram. And um, I'm calling this leg here, capital B prime and this red leg, capital B bar prime. So the calculation, the replica tricks for the von Neumann entropy of this B here in the tensor network and the von Neumann entropy of this B here in the ADS CFT setup, those replica tricks look the same. If the dimensions of uh, the blue leg is given by E to the area of the blue surface, and if the dimension of the red leg is given by E to the area of the red surface. So there's this analogy, and what's gonna be so useful about this analogy is that there is an alternative argument to compute the von Neumann entropy of capital B that I will give you. And so we can compute it in the tensor network very easily. And because the replica trick would have also computed it, it must give the same answer. That replica trick is identical to the one in ads -CFT. So the answer would be the same in ads -CFT. Um, That's the basic idea. So how do, okay, so given that they're the same, how do we actually compute the von Neumann entropy of capital B? And I want to emphasize that I, I didn't say this 
we're doing it this sort of roundabout way because it's really hard to, to if I scroll back up, it's really hard to actually compute this thing um, for a, a general setup. So to actually com to compute the sum over geometry is really hard, but to, to use this alternative method to compute the bundle entropy would be actually tractable. That's why I'm using the alternative method. What is the alternative method? It's to use the one-shot decoupling theorem. So this was something that was proven in this paper by um, Berta, Christendel, and Rayner in 2008. And it says the following thing. So I'm gonna sort of zoom out here so you can see everything. So it says, it says in this tensor network, if the difference in areas is less than the smooth conditional min entropy, right? So this is the smooth conditional min entropy of this leg B prime given little b. It's, that's the same quantity that showed up in our refined conditions for the QES prescription then you're guaranteed that a certain density matrix uh, decouples. So what is that density matrix? Let me explain. So we're imagining you take a state, uh, row, sub, little b, little b prime, little b bar. So that's some state that you're deciding to put in on all three of these bulk legs. So you just picked a bulk state, you're gonna put it in, and um, you know, you could, push that through these tensors, their isometries, all the way to capital B and capital B bar, and you would get a state on the boundary. So this, that's the familiar sense in which tensor networks define a map from bulk states to boundary states. You just put a bulk state in and it maps to a boundary state. But don't push it all the way through. What I wanna do is take this bulk state and push just the B prime part out a little bit. So you, so you put a state in all three legs, you push the parts, use the isometry that this tensor defines to push that part of the state to be a state on the red and blue legs. So now you have a state on little b, little b bar, and the red and blue leg. Then you can trace out little b bar and the red leg, and you're left with the density matrix on just little b and the blue leg. It is that density matrix that decouples. So the, that density matrix will uh, be approximately equal to just the density matrix on little b, tensor producted with uh, the maximally mixed state on the blue leg. That, that's a theorem by these people. So given this condition, then this is true in this tensor network. It's random tensor network. It involves like the averaging over unit series. That's significant because it means that if you computed the von Neumann entropy of B, so the von Neumann entropy B um, will have to be close to the von Neumann entropy of this decoupled state because you know, little b and the blue leg are, uh, are related by an isometry to capital B. Right? You can push the state there out to be a state on capital B. So if you compute the von Neumann entropy of capital B, it's just the von Neumann entropy of the state here on little b and the blue leg, which is approximately decoupled and therefore equals this, right? The von Neumann entropy of a state like this, this a tensor product is just the von Neumann entropy of one. So the von Neumann entropy of the, the, the blue leg part is just the A2 over 4G Newton plus the von Neumann entropy of the little b part, which is here. What have we shown? We've shown that get, if this is true, if the area difference is less than the, the min entropy, this smooth conditional min entropy, then you can be confident that the von Neumann entropy of capital B equals um, the area of the blue surface plus the von Neumann entropy of little b. That, let me scroll back up to the refined formula, Oops. this thing. I've shown you this bottom line, right? So if the min entropy is greater than the area difference, then this is the von Neumann entropy. 
So this is how we know that this is a good condition, that if, if this is satisfied, you can be confident that you can use the QES prescription. You don't have to worry that there's some other contradiction that people haven't thought about um, lurking behind some corner. This, this theorem proves that under this condition, you can safely use the QS prescription. If you do the same thing, but for the complement, you um, can derive this top line. So that's how you drive the, both the bottom and the top line. And then to get, um, okay, so that leaves this middle regime where we haven't proven it that you can or cannot use the QS prescription. Um, so in fact, there's a converse of the decoupling theorem that can prove that it in general won't be, the answer won't be given by the QS prescription. And, and also there's these examples that we've written down like the first contradiction um, that shows that it's in general, uh, that in this regime it's in general not given by the QS prescription. Hey, Chris, can I ask yeah. two questions? Yeah. So uh, first about this uh, restriction to the fixed area states. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh -huh. the, the reason why uh, I, the argument for the fi showing it that it's true for fixed area states is sufficient is because I guess it's related to the question I asked earlier about the fact that the different states that you're considering actually correspond to the same semi-classical geometry, which you assume that somehow the you know the the fluctuations of the areas of the two surfaces are kind of you know have a small width and therefore it's it's the same. It doesn't matter if you project on fixed area states. Is this related to that? That is important here. Yeah, that's related. Yeah, that's important. And um, there's an additional argument that we have to make, um, which is basically that uh, you can, so you can say, you can make the arguments that in a general state, not fixed area, the von Neumann entropy of capital B is within a certain window of the average, um, of the fixed area states that make it up. So like a general state, okay. you know, it's like some- That sounds like the statement of the fluctuations of the area, that the background is semi-classical and therefore the area fluctuations are, you know, constrained within some kind of blank and distance from the- Yes, it is important that there's like some sort of like uh, fall off of the area fluctuations. Yeah, if you had crazy area fluctuations, it would, um, we would not be able to make this argument. Yeah, we use the fact that it's like a semi-classical state with, um, that can be regarded as some um, like some of uh, some superposition of fixed area states where this the uh, support on different areas dies uh, like a Gaussian yeah. as you go out to higher areas yeah okay uh, uh, and another uh, quick question so in this intermediate regime uh, where uh, you don't know exactly what's happening so am I right to think of this as the regime within which um, you can't reconstruct operators or the state in B prime in either of the two complementary regions that somehow you need access to both to the entire boundary or a different, is it, is it true that I yes. cannot? Okay. Yeah, that's right. Failure uh, so of the economic stimulus surface prescription, uh, you know, also, okay. It implies the failure of the reconstruction theorems in either B or B prime, capital B or capital B prime in your figure. Exactly, yeah. So another way of saying it is that both capital B and capital B prime have partial information about little b prime. Yeah. And that, that regime. Right. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, yes, so as Lampress um, got us, so after making this argument for fixed area states, we have to then say uh, this is true for general states. So it's true for, when I say general state, I mean uh, holographic states that we usually consider as nice semi-classical states. So ones where uh, that can that can be considered to be superpositions of fixed area states that um, where the support on the different areas dies off sufficiently fast. So like a like a Gaussian in the area, um, which is something that is true in the in for semi-classical states. And in that case, um, if you compute well, let me leave it at that. Yeah. So the, the correction for a general state is order log G. So um, everything we showed was sort of exact for fixed area states. Uh, but then the von Neumann entropy of capital B, you should trust up to only order log G Newton um, for non fixed area states. Like at least that's the limit of our proof.
Okay, so um, to conclude, so the QS prescription, which is vital to holography, has refined conditions for when you can apply it. Um, there's a certain regime in which it will not give you the right answer. And these conditions are derived from one shot quantum information theory, which I want to say is important for holography. I think that's the, one of the main lessons. Uh, one shot quantum information theory is the branch of information theory that talks about the max and min entropy. These are, these are quantities that are related to like, how much, given a state, how much can you compress it if you just have one copy, as opposed to like, if you had n copies and the limit n goes to infinity, that's a different question. Thank you. Questions for Chris. I have one, I guess. Okay. So to redo this state in gravity instead of a tensor network, do you need to make any further assumptions? I mean, it, it, I guess the, you know, the tensor network picture has some sort of, you know, averaging over random tensor networks. Is, is there sort of an analogy in the gravitational picture or? Yeah, good. So. Um... All you have to do, so yeah, so it's in the tensor network, after you do the averaging, you get a quantity um, that looks like the gravitational path integral. And it's at that level that there's this equivalence um, in, the, in this calculation. So in, in the gravitational path integral, all you have to do is set up the replica trick. Um, you don't have to worry about whether or not you're averaging. Yeah, just the path integral itself is already set up to give you um, this answer. So like you could do, the you could show this decoupling theorem in gravity just using the gravitational path integral. Okay. So I have a question uh, and, and apologies for, for missing a bunch of the first part because I was in Chicago virtually. Um, oh, yeah. So, hey, um, well, I guess maybe I have a couple of questions, but what, one question, <clears throat> Some time ago, I, I was quite interested in essentially trying to understand if if there's an ex explicit construction of 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 states where um, where this bulk entanglement entropy would would be an important um, contribution. Um, I'm wondering if just an ADS, like starting with with some standard example of ADS CFT, do, do you have a particular uh, microscopic construction in mind of of states where where you would run into all these issues, and, and sorry if you already talked about it. Um, I guess it depends on how microscopic you want to go. So I, the example that I, I gave that I usually talk about is this one where um, this is the setup, and I just put a bunch of dust in this middle region B prime. Uh, I, I haven't constructed this from a Lagrangian, but I, uh, but surely this is a state that, like, all, all I'm doing is like using um, like it's the Oppenheimer Schneider collapse setup. Uh, I, I just went, yeah, a bunch of dust. Um, this is a setup that I explored in an earlier paper with Adam Levine and uh, Stefan. Did you, so is, is this sufficiently microscopic? Well, I guess, you, I, I guess I was, I mean, what, what we were trying to do um, a while ago was something like a path in, a path integral construction of a state, something where I could okay. imagine doing um, a separate um, CFT calculation of, of entanglement entropy and, and gravity calculation Good. of entanglement entropy. Um, I mean, in particular, the thing yeah. I was really interested in exploring was whether, so I was cu curious about whether um, if I have the situation where I have a bunch of matter that's in a pure state, and then if I have a bunch of matter that has basically the same um, gravity description, the same stress tensor, but it's an, like entirely entangled with some reference system outside. Good, yes. Um, you know, what is, the, I wanted to understand, um, for example, what, is there any difference in the dynamics there? It does seem like the, so actually I, I found some, there was this puzzle at some point I was, I was worried about. I don't, I don't know if I ever read it anywhere. I, I think um, the puzzle was like, if if you have that second situation, um, then it seems like your entanglement entropies in the CFT would be very different, even though the gravity picture looks the same. And 
So I was wondering, uh, is the dynamics actually the same on, in gravity as we would expect it to be? Um, or could there actually be some modification of gravitational dynamics in, in that second case? And that's very interesting. So the second case was where you had some system purified by a reference system that was outside of. Yeah. So this uh, is a question like, does, yeah. does, the, does, the, does gravity work in the same way? Are there some weird corrections yeah. that, that come up because of that? And the kind of way I, I wanted to approach it was thinking about when, when you're in these cases where we can kind of derive Einstein's equations perturbatively in EDS right. and T, then your starting point is sort of looking at entropies of, of subregions and um, and using that right. to make a connection to the geometry. And and that map seems to be very different. Like when I have, at least with the naive yes. of extremal surface prescription, that map seems to be very different. I would have very different um, entanglement wedges. And ah, mm -hmm. so it seems like something could go wrong with, or with, with sort of deriving Einstein's equations, you might get something else or some corrections. I thought it'd be very interesting to, to probe that. But I ran into the problem of not being able to to construct states in the CFT that had these properties and in a simple way, like, I, you know, we were trying to use path integrals and think about like coupling one CFT to another CFT in the path integral um, in order to generate this, this reference matter. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. So um, would you be happy if the matter in the bulk was a big black hole or do you want it to be more mundane? Yeah, so I wanted it to be more mundane. I wanted it to be like oh. your dust. Um, I see. I see. So, so dust, pure state dust with some stress tensor that is back reacting, and then fully entangled dust, fully entangled with a reference. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting point. Yeah, I hadn't thought about how it would change this derivation of Einstein's equations. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know that we got very far thinking about it either, but it just, it just felt like something would, would be behaving differently because the first step is, is, is a step kind of establishing this connection between the, the ball entanglement entropies and, and the surfaces. Yeah, so I don't have a more microscopic description, but I do think that if you want to talk about um, like, any sort of subregion duality, like uh, if you're trying to find the entanglement wedge of all these different regions of the boundary, uh, the proper way to do it is to not consider what we call the, uh, what we, you know, everyone's called the entanglement wedge. Um, yes. But but instead consider something that uh, we, we call the max EW and the min EW, which is, yeah. um, which is uh, something defined in terms of the like area plus max entropy and the area plus min entropy. It's not minimizations of these things, it's slightly more complicated, but uh, I th yeah, I think if you had complicated mixed states in the bulk, you could, um, that would be how you would make sense of subregion duality. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, but I don't, yeah, I don't know how that would, it wouldn't, yeah, I don't know how that would help uh, your, your calculation. But your results, I guess, in the, in the end, would, would you still say that if you have this matter that's, that's very entangled that I, I would expect a different entanglement or a different, uh, okay, now I know. Now I'm not exactly sure what, I'm, what I should be asking about, but um, like the, the region that's encoded in, in a boundary subregion, is that, is that different when I have the entanglement versus not the entanglement? I guess it still would be, right? Yes, I would. Yeah, it should be. Yeah, if you have. What's inter what's confusing me about this setup is that, um, so it's it's very much like this dust ball, except you, uh, like either have it be pure or it's entangled with some reference system completely outside, right? Yeah. So if I were to uh, compute. So if I were to use the naive QES prescription on capital B, I would get the same answer in both cases, would I, would I not? Because it effectively, um, like in one case where it's purified by this reference system, it would, uh, actually, sorry. You would get the same answer if you included R, if you were computing S of B union R. Um, yeah, yeah, right. right. 
Right. right. right. Good. So I'm thinking just if you didn't include R, then you would get Good. different answers. Yeah, right. Right. So you would get a different answer. The information that's transferred from B prime to capital B or capital B bar would be different in these two states. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. So it seems interesting that the then the gravitational dynamics of your dust in one case that would be sitting inside the CFT physics of B and in the other case it wouldn't even though that's so interesting. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I found this. I'll show you my my slide. Um, Should I stop sharing? I guess, I guess this was just oh I, I can't share. Okay, that's right. I can uh, quit sharing I think. No, I think I, I don't have permission to to share. Oh. It's you do now if you want. To. Okay, yeah, I'll just quickly show. I mean, this is just it's just um, this is from a, a talk a while ago, but anyway, I think it was probably clear what I was talking about. But but yeah, mm -hmm. basically this this picture. Um, yes, good. Uh -huh. so then, like these 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 guys here, they're you know they're having some dynamics and, and it's just in, in one case, it seems to be sitting inside these degrees of freedom and the other case it, it doesn't. And I don't understand like, what is the thing that, that tells you that the bulk physics is the same um, even, even though it's the description is extremely different or even more exciting would be if there's actually some differences in, in the dynamic. Yeah. Right, 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 right. This seems to relate to some sort of like, energy conditions or something where you, you know you give all this matter entropy and then like it, it its energy is different um it like has to it's like forced to be different for this reason um mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah have you thought about it in that context like um like if all this matter was pure yeah it behaves because if i'm understanding correctly it's there's two things going on one is that um this pure and entangled matter uh, its dynamics are or are not encoded in capital B, and the second thing is that they're actually their dynamics are actually different, maybe like they can right. really, which is that's very interesting. Uh, wow. So yeah, it sounds like. But what? Yeah, one possibility is that you know maybe there's some obstruction to setting to setting this up. Um, that's why I was I, I think uh, back uh, when I when I was thinking about that then. We, I guess, some of us at UBCA, Jason was on on this paper. We mm -hmm. we started looking at these multi-trace, um, like taking two right. CFTs and then doing some multi-trace, double-trace kind of coupling between one and the other, and and that seemed to generate that seemed to generate matter, but actually the entanglement was was not of the right order. Like the, ah, we, we right. couldn't get enough matter in there that right. way. So you could get corrections to Einstein's equations, but right, they were at lower order. Oh, that's very interesting. Okay, I see. So you had a hard time getting uh, enough entanglement to make this weird. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. That's right. So then. That's very interesting. So this this suggests like uh, wow. Interesting. So like even putting mixed state matter into the bulk seems somewhat dubious. Like we don't have a microscopic way of doing this. Even. Yeah. Because you could just regard this as purified. Um, mm. Yes. But so, you know, you, at the time, I wasn't. You know, I felt like it was just a limitation of the the kind of states we were looking at. So, um, like, you know, you could definitely think about. Um, well, one one way to talk about this matter would just be imagine a whole bunch of little black holes instead uh -huh. of your test. It's just a bunch of little black holes, and then you know they're uh -huh. connected to some some ref each one is connected to a, a reference system like Lampros likes to do. Right. Uh, uh -huh. And. And so that would be a, a way to, uh, surely you could make that system, um, but. Yeah, I would expect you could, so, I see. Um, wait, so can I ask, a, so regarding how these two things seem to have different dynamics, do you think that this is something you can understand in terms of them just like, having different energy? Well, so I, yeah, let me, let me be clear. I, I'm not saying that they do have different dynamics. I'm just saying that the CFT description of that dynamics seems very changed. different yeah. and it's not clear what the reason would be from CFT that you would get the same classical evolution. So I, yeah. maybe the dynamics yeah. is actually the same. That's what Einstein's equations would predict. But then there's a, a puzzle of how you understand 
like some kind of symmetry or something in the CFP that maps that same dynamics to, to two different um, kind of physical processes there. Yeah, I see, I see. So yeah, maybe the black the black hole thing seems like it it should work. Um, I, actually, I'm still not I'm not totally sure how to how to describe that. If I, if I wanted like a whole bunch of localized black holes in ADS, um, uh -huh. maybe I don't know what uh, what specifically I need to do. In so yeah, I guess actually, what goes like why can't you accomplish this by? I guess this is your like multi trace setup, but like. Like, 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 say I have two CFTs and then I just like couple them in some way that puts in an excitation to each. Um, and then it's it like that, those excitations would be entangled and uh, yeah, I could regard one as... It was just an end scaling thing. I mean, the thing we tried was to add like trace O1, O trace O2. So, uh, so maybe it was just because we were using light operators um, and yeah, I think it was just that our restriction to, we were kind of coupling simple operators in the two CFTs yeah. and using some coefficient and, and the size of that was constrained by kind of ends, there, there's some order n that you can use to make, for it to make sense. And then that only gave rise to like quantum entangled matter yeah, rather than- Yeah, that. it was just a normalization okay. thing essentially. So I guess if, okay. if you okay. added like a very large number of these couplings or of, of course, if you add like a geometrical coupling, um, then mm -hmm. you, can, you can connect the two, but I see. Yeah, we I see. never really did that. Oh, yeah, this is, this is interesting. I, I don't think I have any. Uh, Anyways, it, 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 yeah. it reminded me of that, which I, I guess I don't even know if the, this sort of puzzle even ended up appearing in our paper. But. I see. Yeah, I should take a look because it does sound very interesting. Can I just ask one one more um, question that I, I surely just missed, or actually maybe we're out of time? Are we out of time? We could. There's, no one else has a room booked. Okay. Unless, I guess it's up to Chris whether or not he uh, has the time. I, I've got lots of time. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, I mean, I guess other other people in the group can feel free to hang around or not hang around. But um, so yeah, I guess I okay. I missed the first part of the talk, but I did have a look at the paper, and I I was. Just wanting to understand um, this, these perfect um, compressibility states. Um, is that is the intuition that that's something like ha ha the quantum version of having this single um, classical geometry as opposed to superpositions of geometries, or is it? Um, yeah, it does seem very related to this. Um, yeah, because like if you took a superposition of the TFD and a disconnected um, space time, that would create like that superposition would create uh, a state that was not perfectly compressible. So it's certainly connected. Um, so what? Do you, but now I'm confused. I'm sorry, Chris. I'm confused because I thought you said that the two states that you were superimposing on each other actually um, have the same semi-classical geometry. So it's not. It's not, you don't need the two states to have different semi classical descriptions for your right. RIs, right? So it's, it's actually different. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I, I was, I, sorry, I was trying to say that um, this is like a quantum version of this, uh, like of this, but exactly. Yeah. So I don't, I don't need that. This is sort of like a more general setup. Um, but one manifestation of this is the familiar fact that you can take two semi, two different geometries that are like different semi classical geometries, like the TFD and a disconnected space time. And then, um, superimpose them and then you'll you'll have the same problem uh, and we, we have a, like you know the field has had some set of words to understand what happens when you superimpose those different geometries um, that can but now that can be understood within the context of this this set of I mean it, it might be a bit of an illusion that this the semi-classical geometries are the same so if mm -hmm. if your if your matter collapsed to a black hole in one case that would be maybe connected to something and the other case it wouldn't or. Ah, that's a very interesting point. Yeah. Um, 
maybe in the so I, I'm I feel more confident saying that you can construct a situation where at that time slice the geometries are the same at some particular order in G Newton. Um, but that's a good point that later on the geometry looks very different um, if it's some like collapsing geometry. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe the exterior geometry is still the same. Yeah, that would, that's, you get, that's another good point, because that's what really matters for our calculations, the exterior geometry. Yeah. yeah, and to see changes in that, you need to introduce some additional coupling to like send a negative energy shock wave in or whatever. Yeah, right, right. You're right. Maybe a, a related question though, when you're doing the replica calculation, can you do this as a superposition of geometries? Where you know, uh, like with probability p, you have one of the saddles where you're looking at one entanglement wedge, and with probability p, the other one. Yeah, I think you you could do it that way. Um, I'm not actually sure right now what the how it would look different. Like I would expect it would just look almost identical to regard it this way. Um, so I think the calculation would just like uh, definitely work out. Um, I'm not even sure how. Yeah what the difference would be. I don't think it would be different at all. Give Chris's final official clap. All right. Thank you. Thank you.